Means I'm joined by Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, former Allied Supreme Commander of NATO, former head of the U.S. Southern Command, now the chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation, a partner at Carlisle. And uh, Admiral, I've seen you in a lot of places. I just want to step back. How do you think the war is going? What has caught your eye? Um, the war is going uh, less well for Russia than I think many people believed. Personally, I always had a, a certain level of confidence that the Ukrainians would fight, fight hard, be able to at least slow them down. And I based that on personal experience. The Ukrainians fought under my command in Afghanistan. They deployed on NATO missions um, all over the NATO region. Uh, they've been part of NATO, although not a formal ally. So I visited many times. I know the, the spirit, shall we say, of the Ukrainians. You're seeing that on full display. Um, so I think some have been surprised at the, uh, the level of resistance. Now, quantity has a quality all its own, an old Russian saying. And gradually, I think, unfortunately, the Russians will grind them down. Um, so that's been a pleasant surprise. Um, to many. And as well, Hugh, I've been flat out surprised that the Russians haven't pulled the cyber weapons out of the bag. I think they are holding those off almost as war reserve. They don't like showing them technically to the West because it gives us the opportunity to reverse engineer them and blunt them. And uh, those are the two things that stand out for me right now. I'll give you a third, actually, since you and I often talk about leadership. President Zelensky has become just a profile in courage. And not just that, a lot of people can be courageous. He, he couples that with pretty extraordinary communication skills. Uh, the speech he gave at the EU, the speech he gave at the Munich Security Conference, his one-liners, you know, I don't want to ride, I want more ammunition. Uh, his, his physical symbolism and changing out of his suits and into hunting gear, uh, you got to like that guy a lot. Um, so it's been a tougher slog than I think Vladimir Putin counted on. I think it'll be tough ahead. And I think the Ukrainians are going to be able to hold on to the western part of their country is how I scored the whole thing. And thus, we may end up with yet another frozen conflict at the end of the day. Admiral, I want to touch about the, uh, the EU's offer of airplanes. I gather these are MiG-29s that are in the inventory yeah. of some NATO countries. Does Ukraine have the pilots necessary to fly these? They do, and that, that's a very good thing. And if you look at those long Russian columns uh, headed inbound, uh, and you look at Russians just flying transports for logistics, there's some big, fat targets. And uh, yes, three NATO nations have operated the MiG-29s, old Warsaw Pact, notably Poland, right across the border. And yes, the Ukrainians have flown them as well. They, they the Ukrainians, have pilots who have flown everything in the old Soviet, current Russian inventory. So those are very useful addition to their kit. Are you surprised that the Russians haven't yet seized control of the skies? Um, I am surprised. And I think that um, there is a, a, another issue here for Vladimir Putin. You know, the old saying in the military is that um, professionals study logistics while amateurs are worried about strategy. Um, I, I don't think that's entirely true, but I suspect Vladimir Putin's generals were pretty focused on the strategy and not enough on the logistics. And uh, two indications of that, one of which you mentioned, they haven't truly consolidated control of the sky. Both there are still Ukrainian jets flying around. There's still Ukrainian anti-air systems in place. The U.S., believe me, would have taken all that out in the first 48 hours. Um, the other problem is the pure logistics, moving fuel, food, blood, everything you need to the front lines. Pretty clearly, that's part of the slowdown here. And it's related to, final point, related to the fact that the Russians came in on at least four, maybe seven axes, uh, however you score it. And, you know, when you attack everywhere, sometimes you attack nowhere because you've divided your forces. They underestimated the Ukrainians uh, and they overestimated their ability to go in on multiple axes. They're paying the price. 
Now, tonight is the State of the Union, Admiral, and I hope that I hear the president announce sanctions on Russian oil and gas, because the export of oil and gas, the last thing they've got, uh, we very carefully crafted the sanctions to avoid hitting that because Europe and, and the United States, to a certain extent, depends upon Russian oil. But with these pictures this morning from Kharkiv and atrocities and the use of cluster munitions against children and women and civilians, I don't know that the president has much of a choice uh, other than to do everything he can short of kinetic uh, confrontation. I completely agree, and I think you and I talked about this uh, maybe 10 days ago. Um, I've, I've been surprised at the, incre in the incrementalism of the sanctions. I understand the logic of it up to a point, but we're kind of past the point where you need to hold anything back. Putin is grabbing the dirty tricks bag and pulling everything out. Uh, we need to really slam the economic door and strangle his economy. And I think you got to go after oil and gas. I'll tell you one thing they've done that I really applaud is going after the central bank, the Russian central bank assets, which the Russian central bank foolishly allowed significant portion of their war chest, their $500 billion that they've been holding back for this moment. Foolishly on their part, they parked a lot of those assets in the West. I think they underestimated the degree to which the Europeans would come along in these sanctions. So they don't have the foreign reserves they had hoped for. They're seeing massive personal sanctions and broad economic sanctions. As you say, oil and gas is kind of the last card to play. I think that's coming. Uh, I hope it's tonight. It would make the State of the Union special. Now, I am uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, psychologist, and I don't project my impressions of leaders onto the under the media, because I'm not in a position to judge Putin's state of mind. I just know what he's doing, and what he's doing is re reverting to Chechnya and Syrian tactics. Uh, in terms of what you've seen, I, I can judge the state of the mind of the German public, because all of a sudden, nearly 90% of them support massive hikes in defense spending. As a former NATO allied Supreme Commander, that's got to surprise you and encourage you. It's been uh, quite amazing to watch something I've been personally lobbying for and advocating for, along with the entire U.S. government for, you know, three decades, and in my case, four years as Supreme Allied Commander, literally buttonholing Chancellor Merkel and then Minister of Defense uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who's now the head of the European Union, um, personally buttonholing them and begging them to increase defense spending. And all of a sudden, in 48 hours, Vladimir Putin has shown He's a much better persuader than Admiral Jim Stavridis. So I'm highly encouraged by this. I think it's been a wake-up call for Europe. And by the way, watch Sweden and Finland. If you woke up in Stockholm and Helsinki and you're outside the NATO alliance, I think uh, this is the week when you start demanding uh, a NATO membership card out of your government. And boy, that's got to be part of Vladimir Putin's worst nightmare. It should be. Now, I am... I am surprised that the West has responded as quickly as it has. I'm gratified that it has. Now the question is the United States' response to all of this. Do you think we'll get an increase in defense spending tonight in the State of the Union? I think we have to see that, and I think it will also be strongly supported on both sides of the aisle, and I hope that the Pentagon will uh, seize the moment to uh, move the dial on um, the choice of weapon system toward the new weapons of war, which are going to be uh, cyber, uh, unmanned systems, space, um, special forces, which are going to end up, I think, being highly useful in this situation. Um, those are systems we need. Do we still need significant, strong, if you will, conventional capabilities? Yes. Um, and we also, by the way, need to keep our eye on China and other potential opponents. Um, so the Pentagon, I know, has the plans in place to do that. It's going to need a little push from the president tonight. And then I think you're going to see both houses of Congress strongly support this. Now, Admiral, I want to close by talking about the media. I listen very closely when Jack Keane is on and you're on uh, as, as high ranking general and flag officers, I tend to lean in when those people talk. Less so when we've got colonels, very less so when we've got people like me uh, talking about other than domestic politics. What generally, what's the quality of the commentary been in your view on the military side of this? Oh, I think it's been quite good, um, partly because 
um, the U.S. government has been so, shall we say, so generous with, with its intelligence. I, I can't remember a conflict where the Pentagon laid out more clearly exactly what's happening on the ground. And of course, they do that not to make life better for military analysts, but in order to shine a light on what the Russians are doing. It's like having a burglar approaching your house. You know, job one is turn on all the outside lights so you can see exactly where he is and what he's doing. So I think the job of military analysts has been um, easier, if you will, because of the extreme generosity of the intelligence. And then secondly, um, because all of us have seen these playbooks now three, four times. We've seen Putin use these tactics in Georgia. Um, you mentioned Chechnya earlier, uh, Syria above all. I think the real dark end of the spectrum here is Putin gets deeply frustrated and decides to go big, meaning we're just not going to worry about collateral damage anymore like he does in Syria. Um, and start dropping buildings and taking out villages because Zelensky's cell phone signal was there. Pretty soon, you've got Aleppo on the Dnieper River. That's where we go. I, I think that, that's the case. Now, I want to close with a, a giant theory that I want to test on you. Uh, Europe's reaction has been surprising and encouraging. I think it's because the assumption was, while there might be limited wars in the Balkans, while there might be a Georgia incursion, uh, an incursion into Ukraine that results in a minor... That no one thought that a full-scale ground war in Europe was ever going to come back. And the fact that it is occurring, and it, we don't know where he's going to stop, and he put his weapons on high alert, the nuclear force, that just tells us that uh, the Europeans have been dreaming a dream. But you can't walk away from history. Do you agree with that? that? That's the shock, is that little wars were expected, minor provocations, nothing in Europe, but this just throws that all out the, the window? hundred percent. And as I've been saying, it, what we're witnessing is like watching the History Channel from 1939, except it's happening right in front of us. And second point to be made, the 1939 events to 45, that happened within living memory. Um, you know, my mother is alive, vibrant. She remembers World War II. She remembers all of this vividly. In Europe, this rattles old and dangerous ghosts. Admiral Stavridis, talk to you again next week.